This week, we're gonna throw our mixing questions over to a phenomenal drummer turned mixing engineer. He's now a producer and a mixing engineer. His name is Ken Mary. Let's talk to him. What I thought I'd do is, first of all, I'm gonna kind of introduce you. This is Ken Mary, by the way. Uh, he's a friend of mine, and he's also an amazing producer, amazing mixer, and a phenomenal drummer. He's like a hero of mine in, in the drumming world. Um, and anyway, I want to first talk about a little bit of your, um, just a quick background. I, I don't want to go like into your entire career, but I want to ask you about like, what are you most, not just what you're most famous for, but what are you most proud of doing so far in your music career? And that could be just some little artist too. Sure. I mean, well, you know, people are going to always think of the things that have made the most impact. And of course, you know, you, you're going to have to obviously mention, you know, Alice Cooper is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I can't exclude him, obviously. That was yeah. you know, did two world tours with him and some records. And, um, you know, so uh, that's certainly an important part of my background. I was on RCA uh, with my own band called House of Lords. Um, that band actually did fairly well worldwide uh, again, so you can't really not talk about them either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My own band, Soul Shock Remedy, that was on a, a label called REX, which had Sixpence None the Richer. Uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, I've just played on a lot of session stuff. Uh, I've worked with artists, um, everyone from, you know, Bob Carlisle to Kip Winger. Uh, I was on Full House for three episodes. <laughs> Are you serious? Is, I'm totally serious. Yeah, I was on three episodes of Full House. Not many people know that. And the, the really funny thing about that is more people saw me on Full House than on anything else that I've ever done just because it was the number one uh, program, oh, yeah. television program on ABC at the time. I so, remember yeah, my, it very well. Yeah, the, I think it's the prom night episode, uh, the, Dis the season finale in Disney World, and then, uh, and then there's his Captain Video episode where... Um, we're actually getting the video played on MTV. So, so um, what, were you a character actor in this? Or? Yeah, well, I was the drummer. I was the I was the drummer in the band. So I was I was one of Jesse and the Rippers. So oh, okay. It's really kind of funny, you know, when when I tell a lot of people about my background in history, and you know, you know, I'm on you know roughly five million albums that have been sold around the world and things like that, and then you know you get to Full House and like, oh, that's the coolest thing because, <laughs> you know, everybody was growing up at that show. Oh, yeah. and, it's it's kind of a funny. It's oh kind my of a, gosh! It was it was a lot a, of other things I've done. I mean, I've, I've produced tons and tons of records. Uh, you know, going with you know stuff like Northern Light Orchestra, which is fairly recent to bands like Ember, Silverline. Uh, sold almost half a million records with a band called Larue. I mean, there's there's a lot of different things that I've done over the years, and I think I've served in almost every different capacity. I've been a musician. Uh, you know, on the other side of the glass. Uh, I've been a, a, an engineer, a producer, um, you know, I've, I've actually been to some degree a manager where I've, I've walked into offices and put record deals together. Uh, so I, I feel like I have a pretty wide variety of information uh, in terms of about the business and about, about how the business works. And we all know that the business has gone through tremendous changes recently. So, you know, I'm, I'm actually fairly aware with all of those changes too and how much it's impacted you know, all of us, you know, whether right. you're a songwriter or a musician or a producer or a manager, uh, the changes that we've gone through recently have, have definitely impacted everybody. So, Absolutely. I mean, we can talk about that a little bit if you want to, but that's basically, you know, my background really ranges. It's a really wide range. And uh, it's, it's, I will say this, people always go, well, what's the most fun? You know, what do you enjoy the most? And I really enjoy everything. I mean, Damn. I enjoy every aspect of the music business. I enjoy the business meetings. I enjoy the production, I enjoy drumming, uh, I enjoy meeting with the artists, you know, just all of those things are fun to me. So I think it's a, it's a great right. uh, career to be involved in. Um, that, that's awesome. You need to update your Wikipedia, by the way, because it is like, there's like nothing on there. Yeah, I, I was I was gonna read it and I thought, no, he's you've done so much more than this. And, sure. and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if Wikipedia has enough room for your you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Wikipedia, what's funny to me is they definitely tend to focus on, 
you know, uh, what they perceive to be, you know, the most, you know, the hottest ticket at the minute. So, sure. um, yeah, I do need to have uh, some buddies or something. I have no idea how you even go about updating it, but I know that I know that people can update it somehow. It's sort of sure. a, yeah. I think I think people. Wikipedia is one of those things where anybody can access it and anybody can add information. I think they do have people that oversee it to make sure that it's uh, legitimate information. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, because if there's nothing to back it up, then they don't want facts on there that are incorrect, so. Right. Um, well, cool, I wanna talk to you real quick about you as a drummer. How did you get started? And how did you have such a passion in it? And also, I wanna talk a little bit about how disciplined you've been in it. You know, having known that you mentored Christian and having heard some of the things you've made him go through, uh, I want to just talk a little bit about the discipline involved in mastering an instrument like you have. Sure. Well, drumming, it, it, is, a, it is a very challenging instrument, and I think there's a combination. Um, fortunately, I, here's another weird project, but I, I'm hosting a, a film called The Drumming Hall of Fame, and I've had a chance to sit down with some of the greatest drummers of all time, People like Steve Gadd and Steve Smith and Simon Phillips, you know, just incredible drummers. And one of the questions that I've been asking them is, you know, do you feel drumming was a, a natural talent for you or do you feel it was developed? And, and and almost every guy, the answer seems to be that, you know, there is this natural ability. I mean, there is like some sort of, you know, they it, it almost seems like, you know, they didn't choose the drums, the drums choose them. Interesting. Or, you know, and, and I kind of feel the same way. I kind of feel like, you know, when I started out, it was just one of those things when I was a kid, I was always playing with pencils on the desk, the teachers would have to take it away. And so when I think you get into like fifth or sixth grade and they say, hey, would you like to play an instrument? And I was like, well, yeah, you know, I'd like to play drums. Drums are fun. Yeah. And so I think there was a natural aptitude. There was like a natural inclination there to play drums. And then I think at, at that point, um, if when you love something that much, it's not even a, really a question so much of discipline, but it's a question of, you know, when I was a kid, I used to play drums all the time. I mean, mm. hours and hours. Uh, of course, the neighbors loved that. Of course, <laughs> and your parents. But, <laughs> but it really was something, I didn't have to think about how do I discipline myself to do this. It was just something that happened automatically. I loved playing and I would play uh, as many hours as I was allowed. So, um, but I will say that there, you know, when you get back to the discipline of it, Drumming is a very disciplined instrument, and you do have to do things and practice on things that maybe wouldn't necessarily be the most fun, but that are going to benefit you the most. And I will say that drumming, I think, was a very good beginning because the discipline that you do learn in, in that learning that instrument is something that you can apply to anything else in life, whether it's skiing or some type of athletics or whether it's engineering or producing. Uh, the discipline and the attention that you pay pay at uh, at practice for for drumming is is something that you can kind of roll over into everything else you're doing. So, yeah, um, I, I guess that might be the point you're asking me is is about discipline. Yeah, and and it, it's interesting how many um, how many producers were former drummers. You know, that start off as drummers. I, I've talked to so many well, people that they're like, oh, yeah, I play drums, too. I'm like, well, of course you do. You're now producing. Sure. And <laughs> well, I have a theory on that one. And oh, my, yeah. my theory is that that drumming is a, is a very challenging instrument because it's really a supportive role. I mean, you're you know, you're not the lead singer. You're not the guitar player. Uh, but at the same time, you are the foundation of the music. I mean, you, it's yeah. a very... I mean, when you think about music, and this is something we're talking about in the Drumming Hall of Fame uh, movie, that if you imagine music, if you just took out the drum track, imagine music, if you took out, imagine rap, if there were no drum groove in it, imagine pop with yeah. no drum groove, imagine jazz without a That's drum that groove. foundation, I mean, absolutely. You could take almost any style of music with the exception of possibly classical. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, we got locked up. We got locked up. And move the drums and all. Sorry about that. You're back. Am I back? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, where did I lock up? So oh, you were just saying just any style of music, maybe with the exception of classical. Yeah, almost any style of music, if you think about drums and, and the, the pivotal role that they play. Mm. And then I think, you know, when you, get, you say, well, how come so many drummers are producers? 
Um, I think it's it's they feel a little bit out of control in a band situation. Uh, you know, you are a very critical component of it, but then at the same time, you know, you really don't have a lot of control necessarily. I mean, there are exceptions to the rule, of course, but most of the time the drummer is sort of playing a supportive role and isn't necessarily usually the writer or the singer or, you know, coming up with, uh, you know, comp I mean, in my case, it was a little different because I was a writer, but but mm. for most drummers, I think they feel like they want to be in control of something. And I think production is something that they can, you know, apply discipline to and then help use their skills uh, to help other people. So I, I think there's, there's probably some element uh, of that. I, I think that that's probably why a lot of drummers go into production. They feel like, hey, you know, I can help some other people and I can kind of control what's coming out in the end, you know, which I right. never got a chance to do before. So, I mean, in my personal situation, being a drummer in, in the bands I was in, you know, we were always co-producers on our records. So oh, interesting. Um, I, I always had a hand in the production and always had some sort of input, uh, whether it was with the songwriting or the production. So I didn't personally feel that way, but that's my, that's my hypothesis. Wouldn't you think that um, just as an added benefit doesn't, I mean, I have found in my production that as I'm writing lyrics and melody, that I have a, because I have that background in drums, now I don't have nearly the background you do, but I have a pretty solid background in, in taking private drum lessons and then bands and orchestra and things like that, that I can, I, I'm very conscientious of how things are uh, syncopated, how words are syncopated. And I, I, I really think, especially in pop music right now and in hip hop and stuff, so much of the, the uh, lyrics and melody are more, it's almost more about the syncopation of how the words feel than it is the lyrics themselves, or even sometimes the melody. Would you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. I yeah. think when you get down to pop music, uh, there's some very famous producers, I think Quincy Jones is one of them, that has said, you know, if you have your, your groove and you have your melody, you're you're pretty much you know that's almost the song i mean if you had your melody lyrics and groove you can you can almost the the rest of the song will almost write itself yeah. so um, i think being a drummer does kind of give you some advantages in that regard i think it does give you an advantage in terms of uh, the musical syn syncopation of the lyrics um and definitely the groove of the song for sure which i, I think is again just one of those critical components that, you know, when you think of all the major hit songs, there's probably something going on in that rhythm that you are attracted to. Right. So it's a big part. It's a big part of music. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, let's talk about your other skills. Um, besides playing drums, tell me about your other instruments you play and, and uh, if you sing and things like that. Sure. Well, I do sing. Um, I do play a little bit of keyboards enough to program things. I'm definitely not a keyboard player, mm. um, but I do know enough to where I can program what I want to hear. Um, I play a little bit of guitar, uh, but I would say aside from drums, vocals are probably, you know, the next instrument. I've actually sung lead in Soul Shock Remedy and performed live wow. <laughs> in large situations as a lead vocalist. So, you know, I feel very cool. comfortable in that situation as well. Now, if somebody said, hey, would you go up on stage and play keyboards? You know, that's a that's a whole different story. <laughs> of course, I think you're probably also asking about engineering. I think engineering is certainly a skill too, and that's something that does take some years to develop. Uh, and um, I guess that's another one of the skills. And then, of course, production. I think production is is a skill. You know, I do feel comfortable um, working with people and sort of steering as a producer. Uh, my personal take on it, and there's a lot of guys that have different production styles. Uh, my sure. personal style is, you know, I'm very sensitive to the artist because when I was an artist, if I was working with a producer that didn't want to hear what I had to say and wasn't concerned with my vision at all, um, I found that that pretty tough to work with. So, you know, I, I have a sensitivity, I think, for artists and the fact that, you know, I do want to listen to them. I want to find out what they want to do. Uh, I mean, I will steer the ship as much as they allow, but if somebody says, hey, I really want to do this, you know, I really want to do this, and even if it's something that I totally disagree with, I mean, I'll tell them, I'll right. say, well, are you sure you want to do this? I'm kind of like that computer prompt where, are you sure you want to delete that file, you know? Um, 
Yeah. I can testify to this because you've done that with me several times. Exactly. Like I don't agree with it, but yeah. you know what? I tell you what, it's your album and it's you, you know, you're going to live or die by this record. And, and I'm not going to like I, my career will go on, but your career is going to be judged based on this recording. So I always have a sensitivity to that. And I always try to make sure that I, my job in, as a producer, in my opinion, is to capture their vision and give them the best possible odds for success in a very, very difficult industry. I can imagine that has got to be extremely challenging when you're trying to balance your opinions with the artist's opinions with all their friends and family that are coming into the sessions and giving you feedback. And you're like, well, you're not really the artist, but thanks for the feedback. And how do you <laughs> how do you manage that? I mean, that's incredible people skills that, that go into that, I would imagine. Well, you know, it's tough. And sometimes, you know, you do want to throw everybody out of the studio. I mean, yeah. there, there are times where, you know, you really want to do that. And, and generally, um, I think, you know, what I try to do, I mean, like if somebody has input, sometimes it's valuable input. I mean, even if they're not a musician, even they're just a friend of the family. I mean, sometimes they'll say, you know, hey, I, you know, I don't really like that part or I don't like the way the vocals sound on that. And sometimes those opinions are actually valuable because they're not musicians. They don't care. They just know what they like and what they don't like. Sure. And sometimes you'll, you'll find some value in that, especially if you hear it from multiple places. Like if you hear it you know, from that person, then you hear the same thing from somebody else. You know, those are those are things that you might want to listen carefully to because yeah. I find that some of the people that have the best innate ability to determine like, okay, that's a hit or that's not a hit um, are non-musicians. I'll give you a great example. My wife is just zeroes in on that kind of stuff. She'll hear a song on the radio uh, months and months before it's a hit and she'll go, that's going to be number one. And I'll go, yeah, right. You know, because, you know, I'll listen to it and you know, maybe not like it that much or whatever. And I'm like, okay. And then sure enough, you know, months later, it's really? number one. Hit. So I think, you know, there are some people uh, where, you know, I, I would, I would say she should be an A&R. You know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes input is valuable yeah. and, and, you know, you have to make that determination for yourself. You know, yeah. is this value, is this valuable input? Does it sound like something that's going to help me or not help me? But I, I think as a producer, you have to listen. I think that's, that's a really important part of the, of the process and a really important part of the role of a producer is to listen to the people around you and then obviously you have to sift through it you know sometimes yeah. people are going to have bad ideas and sometimes people are going to have good ideas and you know your job is to sift through i mean there's certain things that i produced where i didn't touch i mean i didn't do anything to it because it was right and it was perfect and there's a trick to that too like if it is perfect you need to be smart enough to leave it alone and not mess with it and then by the same token, if something's wrong with it, you have to be smart enough to figure out what's wrong with it. Is it the chording? Is it the lyrics? Is it the arrangement? You know, what's not working in this? Is it just the song itself? Um, and I always joke with new artists. I always say, well, you know, if you have good songs and you have bad songs, record the good ones. <laughs> You know, because yeah. you know, it's, it's such a basic thing, but people are like, well, I don't really like this song. It's like, well, if you don't like it, why are you recording it? <laughs> Record good songs that you care about, right, that right. you feel something from, and then hopefully other people will, will care about the song too. But, you know, if you're doing songs that you don't even like, why should somebody else like it? Why would like you expect it? somebody else to like it? Exactly. That actually is a great segue because the next thing I want to talk to you about is what what do you think makes a great song? You've heard a lot of songs in your career, both both sure. just on the radio, but of course, songs that you've worked on. And what are some of the um, key elements that you think really makes a great song? Well, that's actually pretty easy because if you listen to a lot of different styles of music, I mean, whether it's rap or pop or country, uh, or rock, sometimes the only thing you can really differentiate uh, is in the lyric. And so I think lyrics are a critical, critical component of a hit song. And I, I think if you go back and you listen to all the hit songs, you're going to see some commonality. You're going to see, oh, wow, you know, this was a great lyric. This was a great lyric. You know, that was a great lyric. I don't think you're going to really hear any hit songs that don't have good lyrics. Whereas I think you you know, you may hear some hit songs that maybe don't have a great groove, maybe don't have, you know, maybe it's not the greatest song arrangement. Um, I, I could give examples, but I don't want to, I don't want to slam anybody's art, so I'm not going to, but I will, okay. I will tell you this, there's songs that I know that are absolute, you know, massive hits, that the arrangement is just not good. I mean, they're just not good arrangements. 
um, but they still are hits because of the lyrical content. So I think when you touch a nerve, and because and, when you think about music, and this is what I think about music, music, you know, the only reason people buy music is to feel something. You know, they're wanting to feel something emotionally. And usually the easiest way to have that happen is a great vocal track, a great lyric, uh, and a good groove. You know, if you have those three elements, I think those are probably some of the most important, important components to a hit song. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Okay. Um, and uh, as far as outside of lyric, what, what, what would you say is king? The melody, the groove, the arrangement, the instrumentation, the feel? I know probably every part of that is important, but what, what do you usually elevate o over the other parts of the construction of a song? Well, I think uh, if you're, you know, you're saying, okay, the lyric is, is absolute king, which I believe the lyric is absolutely king, uh, the next thing in line to me would be melody and then groove. I, I think, uh, and possibly in some cases, groove over melody. I mean, it just depends on the style of music. Uh, you know, obviously, in, in, you know, when you're talking about something like rap or hip hop, you know that's going to you know that those those roles may reverse where the sure. groove is much more important um okay. but but i think you know essentially that that would be my order if i was going to prioritize okay. it i'd probably say uh you know lyric melody and then groove and then after that the instrumentation and certainly the arrangement is important too i think the arrangement is maybe less important because i have heard a lot of hit songs where the arrangement is kind of you're like, wow, that's really odd and somehow doesn't totally work, but the song's still connected with people emotionally. Yeah. And I think that, the, I think that that's the, the bottom line with music. I think all production or being a musician or whatever it is you're doing with music, I think if you can sit back and you can listen to it and it moves you in some way emotionally, then I think you've won. And I think that even if everything else was perfect, you know, even if you felt like, okay, these are great lyrics, this is a great vocal track, the groove's great, the instrumentation's great, the arrangement's great, uh, but it, it's not moving you. Like, you you sit back and you listen and you go, you know, yeah, I'm just not feeling this. Then nothing else matters. I mean, if you don't feel it, then you're, you're in trouble. Right. Oh, that's so important. Um, talk to me a little bit about when you're producing or when you're going to mix somebody that has produced something. Um, the process of mixing while you're producing and is that necessary is that preferred how important is that okay so you're, are you asking me like as a mixer if i would want to hear what the producer had in mind with the mix while he like when i get it or i'm not i'm not quite yeah I, I guess what i'm saying is instead of having a very specific um I mean, I've heard kind of how that there's been a real change in instead of just the producers just producing, getting the tracks down, throwing it to a mixer and expecting them to do magic. There's the, the lines have been blurred a lot more and that you, you kind of have to now, especially with pop music, the mix is sort of the production. Would you agree with that? Well, it's definitely part of the production. And I think that it's it's uh, if you're asking me, you know, as a producer, if you if you have the mix in mind as you're working on the song for me that's absolutely yeah i mean if i if i'm producing a song i'm kind of mixing it as we go along to some degree i mean not fully of course but certainly planning on okay you know what's the focus of the mix going to be at this point in the song is it this or is it this and you're having to make some decisions and kind of start weeding out some things so yeah uh, i i think the mixing part of it is definitely part of the production process. I think you're absolutely right when you say, you know, the lines have blurred and you have a lot of guys that are producers and mixers and audio engineers, kind of because you sort of have to be nowadays. Like, I, I think you're right. I think if you're just handing your stuff over to somebody and saying, hey, fix this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are guys that do that. I mean, I've done that on a number of projects where somebody goes, hey, you know, I, I don't know what I have here. I don't totally love this. Can you, you know, make something out of this? And, and I certainly can, but you're getting back to production at that point. Now you're almost reproducing, sure. you know, something that they've put together. So yeah. I, I think in terms of the mixing process itself, you know, I do like to get, like if I'm just strictly mixing something, I do like to hear what the producer and the artist have in mind as a rough. I guess the challenge sometimes is um, there is a real malady that we've talked about. It's called demolitis. And that's when somebody has heard something so many times that anything else sounds wrong. And that's a challenging thing to, to, to deal with too, because I have had some artists where 
you know, they've heard it a particular way for months and months and months. And anything you're going to do to change that in their mind is going to be like, oh, well, that, you know, that sounds wrong, you know, different to me or wrong to me. And so, you know, that's one of the challenges, I think, um, you know, as, as both the artist, I think it's a challenge for them. And I think it's a challenge as the producer and mixer or, or as just the mixer, you know, you're trying to, you know, give them something else. And usually what I say to somebody that's in that situation, I go, look, I know you're not going to like this. <laughs> you know, I know you're not going to like this at first, but this is what I'd like you to do. You know, and if we have the time to sit on the mix for a few days or maybe even a week, you know, I'll say, look, just listen to this for like a week and then go back and listen to the other one and you tell me what's better. And if you like the other one better, then we'll go back and do something more like that. But, you know, when we have the time, uh, uh, you know, which is a luxury in most situations, you know, that's what right. I'll try to do. Because it's really tough to fight against demoitis if an artist has it. Oh, absolutely. You know, if, yeah. if they really are in love with what they did on their demos or their rough mixes and they just want you to duplicate the same thing, then you're almost like, well, you know, yeah, I mean, and you can do that too. I mean, you could take what they did mm -hmm. and just run it through like a major SSL console and put some analog processing and analog EQ and analog effects. And, you know, you definitely can enhance it too and maybe end up with something that's that's good enough. It's just, it just, just like every situation, it depends. Yeah, no, I am so guilty of that. It's, it is very hard to pitch, to throw your stuff over the wall to somebody else who has a different brain and they have a different take on it. Um, one of the things I am finding out as I've been doing this, because I, I, I do not claim myself as a mixer at all. I, I love to produce and I love to write. And so I'm trying to lean on produce, uh, mixers like you and engineers like you and um, a couple people over in LA as well to, to tell me, you know, this is how you need to balance this out a little bit. But one of the things I'm finding that has been a real key for me is to learn to specify what is the voice that you want to be heard in this part of the arrangement. Um, you know, is it the guitar right here? Is it that, you know, little lead on the, is it that cool little effect? What do you want to be heard? And once I can communicate that to the engineer, hey, this is the point in which I want that to be the voice. I, I find that that goes a long way because then it helps them go, oh, okay. I, I know where you're trying to go. Instead of, I've got all these sounds and you want me to blend together. It's, no, this is the sound. This is all just fluff <laughs> behind it. Does I that resonate that, with you at all? Uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I think your job as a mixer is a little bit more like um, possibly a, a movie director, uh, which, which, you know, you'd think it'd be more like the editor at the end. But what I think about as a movie director hmm. Uh, when you when you look at a film and you go like, OK, OK, now I'm looking at, you know, the director's pointing you. He's saying, OK, now I'm looking at the guy getting into the car and now I'm panning over to this and now I'm going into the building and now I'm seeing this guy that's being held captive or whatever it is, you know, like whatever the movie is. Yeah. The director is only showing you what he wants you to see. And, and it's kind of like yeah. that as a mixer, too. You know, as a mixer, you have to go like, OK, the important part here was the, you know, this uh, string part or the important part was this keyboard or the important part was this guitar part. You know, whatever that part is, you know, and, th and that's supposed to be the focus. And that's that's your job in the song is to go like, OK, we're looking at the, you know, the keyboard now. And then like, OK, now we're looking at, you know, the lead vocal and now we're looking at. Um, this drum fill that just came in, and now we're looking that at this. That makes so much so you're, sense, yeah. You're in, in, from an audio sense, you are just directing what the listener is focusing on. Right, and I, you know, it's funny. I don't hear this talked about very much. Uh, through the podcasts I listen to and the, and the stuff I read online, it's always talking about balancing and, and using space and effects and things like that, EQing and notching. But I don't hear the concept of, let's get the, that 80,000-foot view on... How, what are we trying to do here? What is the goal? Not just to blend some nice frequencies together, and that's definitely part of it, but I, I definitely want to, I want this podcast and this YouTube channel to be, to really hone in on some of those 80,000 foot view subjects. And to me, that's a, that's a really important one uh, that I think gets overlooked a lot. It's probably always there, but it's not talked about as much as I think it needs to be talked about. Sure. Um, and I think you're right. I think it's it's really important. I mean, it's a very important process that you have to go through. And a lot of yeah. times as a sir, you're going, hey, you know, these two things are kind of conflicting. And, I, you know, we can't be focusing on both of these at the same right. time. 
And that's happened a lot. I mean, as you know, it's, it's, it happens all the time where you're going, you know, this is a great part and this is a great part, but, you know, we have to choose one here yeah. and we have to focus in on that. So that is, that is always part of the process, deciding what's important. I think that's a big, a big pro and, and also what are you wanting the listener to focus on? Because they don't know when they listen to something, they don't know like, okay, now I'm focusing on the guitar or now I'm fo focusing on the keyboard or now I'm focusing on this, you know, choir vocal part or whatever it is. I mean, they don't know. They just know that, you know, they, they are listening and they are either feeling it emotionally or not feeling it emotionally. And I think that has a lot to do with getting back to the emotion. You know, you're, you're showing them the parts that are going to affect them emotionally in the different parts of the song. So I think, I think it's a big part of the mix. That's awesome. That's it for this week. We'll have part two next week. So come back for that. Do not forget about it. I will remind you. Thank you so much to Ken for doing this interview. And as always, please subscribe. Stay frosty. Keep writing. Later, guys. Hey.